Hello there, I'm Nick, and this is The Game Apologist, where we look for the good and bad games. And we had a pretty good run, didn't we? For a show called Game Apologist, I haven't had to do a whole lot of apologizing for the Sonic series up to this point. I mean, it got a little dicey with Sonic CD, but all in all, the classic Sonic games are classic. I've spent an exhausting amount of time explaining just that, going so far as to say that Sonic 3 and Knuckles is one of the greatest games ever made. I've seen that game compared to Super Mario World, Mega Man X, Donkey Kong Country, and whether or not you like that game over these other ones, it's not important to me. What is important is that it was compared to the very best of the Super Nintendo library, because that's how revered the Sonic franchise was back in the day. That was the general opinion of most gamers. But Sega went in a decidedly different direction with their next game, Knuckles Chaotix. This was a spin-off title for a spin-off system, using the popular Sonic rival as well as a collection of unique characters to experiment on just about every front, everything from the core mechanics all the way down to how you select your character and level. There really isn't another experience quite like this game, be it in the Sonic franchise or in gaming in general. And because of that, it does have its fans, but also its detractors. There's a reason why you don't see this game on the exhausting amount of Sonic game collections in the years that followed. But to even talk about this game, we first need to briefly go over the system it was made for. We all know the story by now, but it bears repeating, lest we allow history to repeat itself. This is the 32X, a little Sega Genesis that sits on top of your actual Sega Genesis. It's basically an add-on that allows you to play 32-bit cartridges on your core system. You can still play regular Sega Genesis games, but it doesn't really change the experience. And the games made exclusively for the 32X can't be played any other way. You need this add-on to play that library. Sega decided to release this horrible tumor of an add-on and release it two months prior to their brand new Sega Saturn, which was already running into 290 problems prior to launch. But just to be completely fair, Nintendo was not above releasing this kind of stupid crap as well. Remember, this was in the same time as the Virtual Boy. And before that, they did release the disk drive for the Famicom, and later would do the same for the Nintendo 64, and neither of those were overwhelming success stories. And that's just the tip of the iceberg. Granted, Sega went a little overboard with the Sega CD, and would later redesign both that add-on and the Genesis itself, and then would go on and pack it all together into one little sexy machine that nobody ever heard of. But my point is that while we make fun of all that nowadays, if Sega had just released upgraded models of the Genesis that included 32X tech or the CD add-on, I mean, it really wouldn't be that much different from the PS4 Pro or the Xbox One X. That's the iPhone business model. And PCs have been outdating their own tech the moment it goes up for sale for decades now. How's everyone enjoying their 3DSs with that extra thumbstick attachment? Oh, and don't forget your Amiibo NFC accessory. Also, so, you need Amiibos. No, those are different from the Skylanders. You have to buy all those separately to get everything out of that game. Oh, wait, did you buy Xenoblade Chronicles? Well, you gotta throw all this crap out, man. That only works on the new 3DS. I, well... Never mind, I guess history was going to repeat itself anyway. But you see my point here? Sega's bonehead decisions really aren't that different from other game companies with the capital to extend the life of their expensive hardware. It's just more apparent when it looks like you're building a snowman out of Sega consoles. Someone had to make these mistakes if anyone was going to learn from them or improve upon the idea. Of course, you could also point out that the Sega CD wasn't exactly an overwhelming success, so maybe don't do that again. But they went ahead and did that again. And I would say much less successfully. Because at least the Sega CD had some truly stellar titles that made the purchase worthwhile. You had Lunar, Popful Mail, Snatcher, and of course, Sonic CD. The 32X, on the other hand, had the worst version of Doom, the worst Spider-Man game, and a bird shmup. That was actually a selling point for me as a kid. I thought this game looked super rad. And that's not to say there aren't good games on the 32X, but the libraries are not comparable, not even remotely close. But the 32X did at least have a Sonic CD equivalent. And Chaotix came out after CD. It came out after Sonic 3 and Knuckles, but it's not quite the follow-up one would hope for. And many would argue it's not even as good as the messy Sonic CD. And I should give you Sonic Warriors a little warning. With this game going forward in the Sonic series specifically, you're gonna be seeing a lot of them on Game Apologist, and not my spin-off show, Unapologetic. That series is set aside for games I feel are truly 
truly masterpieces, games everybody should play. And I don't feel that way from most of the Sonic series. That's not to say I don't love the hell out of games that are going to be coming up. Some of them are some of my favorite games of all time, but I'm also not going to pretend there aren't some glaring issues. And don't get me wrong, the adventure games are going to get their fair shake. I love to explore why people adore those games as much as they do. And in those specific cases, I can at least cut those two games a little slack since they were jumping into a brave new third dimension. But Knuckles Chaotix is a 2D Sonic style game released after the series had mastered mechanics and clearly defined itself in a bloated genre. Even with all the pretenders, there was no mistaking a Sonic game. But Chaotix took a decidedly different direction and probably wasn't the best choice. I was not aware of it at the time, but this would be one of the first of many speed bumps stumbling down the peak that was Sonic 3. Alright guys, we know what a Sonic game is, we know how to make them real damn good, and we have this hot new Echidna character that allows you to experience these levels in whole new ways. Should be a real easy win to spit out another set of levels to placate fans and convince them to throw down for a 32x, that should be a nice, cheap, and easy solution while we work on the Sega Saturn. We have everything we need to hit this out of the park. Yeah, but even with all of this at our disposal, I can't help but feel like Knuckles is missing something. Ah! Perfect! In hindsight, it might seem like another traditional Sonic would have been the right call. And for many young fans like myself, I would have been perfectly fine with that. But that's not what the market demanded. We were ready to jump into a brand new experience. Sonic 3 and Sonic and & Knuckles did not sell as well as Sonic 2. People were growing tired of the formula. And with all these new gaming experiences just on the horizon, if Sega was going to jump back into 2D Sonic, they had better bring something new to the table. And, uh... Boy, oh boy, did they bring something new. Probably too much. Before we tackle anything else, we need to talk about this ridiculous ring tether, because this stupid thing binds itself to all the good ideas this game has and drags everything down with it. In a game series all about speed and momentum-based platforming, the geniuses at Sega decided that you need to constantly drag around a second Animal Man through your entire adventure. Aw, Nick, you big dum-dum, this isn't a Sonic title, you say. And yes, you could argue that this is not a Sonic game, Game, therefore I shouldn't treat it like a Sonic game. But here's the problem. It's not a Knuckles game either. I still remember the first time I started playing this game. Finally, I'm gonna have a fun adventure with my favorite character to play from the Sonic series, and immediately I knew something was very, very wrong. Knuckles was slow and sluggish. The 32X is supposed to power up my Genesis, right? If you were, like me, an idiot kid in the 90s wanting a 32X, then you more than likely wanted it to play Knuckles Chaotix. And you were also probably very familiar with S3K, so you know Knuckles' moveset going into this game. But everything he does feels off. And then on top of that, you slap a giant lizard on me. Great. This is Espio, one of the new playable characters of the game. And outside of him, you have Mighty the Armadillo, Charmy B, and Vector the Crocodile joining the Echidna on this adventure. You'll have a chance to choose one of them after the opening tutorial, and I highly urge that you do. Trust me, everything feels a little bit better once you break free of Sluggles. And they all have their own secondary abilities, and a grand majority of them get you up the side of a wall much faster than Pinky can. Also, I just need to say it, when Knuckles is gliding around with a ball flying all over the place, it kind of looks like he's going commando for all the island to see his magical meaty clackers. Oh, Nick! You interrupt again, you dumb bitch! It's not a Knuckles game either! His name doesn't even appear in the title in Japan! Oh gosh, you're right, Captain. In hindsight, that was really stupid of me as a kid in the 90s to expect a Knuckles game from a game called Knuckles Chaotix. I should have definitely known all those other things going into this. Look, I was excited to play these brand new characters, but I was not happy with them doing my boy dirty here. And if they had built a game around these brand new characters and their abilities, I would have been fine with that. But that's not what we got. Yeah, it's not a Sonic game. And okay, fine, it's not a Knuckles game, but it's also not an SBO game. It's not a Vector game. It's not a Mighty game. It's not a charming game. Doesn't even belong to the damn bomb. 
This game belongs exclusively to the ring tether, and they don't even utilize that mechanic properly. To be fair, this game does what no Sonic game had done up to this point, and provides you a tutorial area, both in the opening isolated island level, and a proper tutorial after that. Feels a little redundant, but fine, sure. This will let you grow accustomed to mechanics like anchoring your partner, building up tension, and slingshotting the pair of you across the level or up to a higher platform. And the slingshot is here probably to replace the spin dash, and don't get me wrong, that is still present, but it's massively gimped. Problem here is that it takes much more time to set up a slingshot. It'd be much more convenient to just zip up the side of a wall, but, well, the game doesn't want you to do that. And take care of what button you're hitting. In old Sonic games, any of the three buttons on a Genesis controller act as your jump button, and in turn will act as the secondary skill of whatever else you're doing. Here in Chaotix, the only button that jumps is the C button. The middle B button will anchor your partner character, and the A button will call them back to your location at the cost of 10 rings. But what if you don't have 10 rings? Does it just not work? <laughs> No way! What kind of capitalist society do you think you live in? You go into the red! Yeah, your ring count can go backwards! Is this Knuckles Chaotix or a Sega business simulator? That joke would be way more funny if that game didn't kind of already exist. Sega's a weird company, man. As a child, you might be wondering how it's possible to give away something you don't have. But little did we realize this game was just preparing us for the misery of adulthood. And actually, this is something I've never come across personally, but while scouring through the instruction manual, I did did come across an interesting tidbit I was never aware of. If you go 100 rings into debt and cross the goal in a level, the game will restart. Yikes. So I guess that could actually make for an interesting little bit of challenge if you wanted it. You have to collect at least 100 rings before you can cross the finish line. That'd be kind of cool. I j uh. Just looking at this control scheme and playing around with the physics, it boggles my mind why they thought any of this was a good idea. If you came into this accustomed to pressing the A button to jump, that's just where your thumb landed, well, too bad, buddy, because that's going to cost you here. Ugh, I mean, they have an entire button dedicated to realigning your duo, which tells me that this setup has the capability of getting you stuck. And if you do get stuck, the game is telling you that it's your fault and you're going to be punished for it. You want to know why people have a problem with this rubber band nonsense? Just head over to a spring, the super common thing that shows up in every other 2D classic Sonic game. Just hop on it and... Yeah, I don't know how any developer hopped onto a spring, looked at this, and thought, yeah, this is a good idea. I'm not even sure if there's any point in explaining the secondary powers of these other characters. There's nothing in these levels built around those abilities. I mean, sure, they're more vertical in design, so climbing up the side of a wall can be very helpful, but it more feels like they shoved everything out of the way just to make use of this stupid ring tether. And before we even get into the levels themselves, choosing one of them, hell, choosing one of your characters, is also a game of skill and luck. Yeah, your character selection is a claw crapping game, and you have a chance to grab one of these two garbage robots that can either slow you down, like with Heavy, or cause splash damage if they are damaged, like with Bomb. So that's also super fun. The levels are no longer in a linear layout like they are with every other Sonic game. They are instead chosen with this goofy bumper here. You only have five zones, but don't you fret, you now have five acts in each and every one of them. Oh god. Man, all of them drag along and they're all bare bones because, again, these are designed to compensate for the random stupidity you can get into when you clap two Sonic characters together and chain shot them across the screen. And being randomized, you can either find yourself in a different zone every time, or more than likely, in Botanic Base four times in a row. Either way, as Retroopolis Zone pointed out in his video, boss battles are usually clumped into the back half of your playthrough. Man, trust me, uh, they are not worth the buildup. This polygonal effect was, uh, I'm sure this was real neat for a minute, but I mean, this lasts for a literal minute. Can we, um, can we, uh, start the fight, please? What is happening here? I mean, I like the new cutscenes before every boss fight, but why on earth did they skimp out on the animation for the one fight I would have loved to have seen that in? The Metal Sonic fight is not great. It's inventive enough. You have to hit the bumper like you would for the levels, but this time it's going to land on a number, which will dictate what attack Metal Sonic uses against you. And when you time it right, it will land on the X, which will damage him. And this can go a couple of different ways, depending on how well you time it. It could be like my first few times where it felt like this 
fight would never end. Or it could be a little bit more like my most recent battle against this robot where I just hit it four times in a row and it was over. <laughs> oh well, at least I got some kind of encounter with Metal Sonic prior to the big Titan transformation. And at least that transformation does look dope. I do like his angry fanged face. Looks way better than another crappy final boss battle with Metal Sonic that skipped the cool base form and jumped straight into some junkyard art installation. <sighs> Not today, Nick. One problem at a time. And like I said, the levels themselves are far more vertical in design. They're usually wide, sprawling, and somewhat labyrinthian. And some of those descriptors would work in a game designed around Knuckles, or even one of these other characters. But that's not what you get here. Don't get me wrong, climbing and air dashing certainly helps out. You could not make it through one of these levels in a solo Sonic experience. But considering how varied the character abilities are, and the fact that you sometimes just have a bomb strapped to you, they can't design anything as tightly as they did with Knuckles' little areas in S3K. Also, what the hell's with the transportation spots in these levels? Those used to be super quick little spurts of speed that got you right back into the game. Here, you have to wait on... Uh nothing, and then lazily get moved into a different room? Or just like, lower down into the same room? What was the point of all that? This level is called Speed Slider. Mm-hmm. There's this one spot that you get a drill car, and all it does is show this automated segment that slowly drives you through an empty room and then drill through like four walls. What is the point of that? People whine about needless gimmicks in Sonic 3, but at least you get to interact with the damn things. I don't even get to control this damn car. What they could have done instead is split up this car into like four different pieces and drop them in different spots on the level, giving your characters some incentive to explore these sprawling maps. But that's not what you get here. The closest the game really gets to that concept is having to track down a button that starts a clock in every act of Amazing Arena. And sure, it lights up the room, but that's literally it. it doesn't activate doors or springs or any fun platforming puzzles, nothing like that. You can actually get to the end of the level without ever activating that dumb clock, and the game just tells you to go back and get it. It's super annoying. In Sonic 3, we had rings to special stages hidden around all these giant maps. And even if you explored a spot that didn't have a giant ring, you at least got a monitor or something for your efforts. And Chaotix does have giant rings hidden around the stages, but they're not for special stages. They're for bonus stages. And I apologize, I promise there's a difference. Bonus stages don't lead you to Chaos Emeralds, or in Chaotic's case, play school stackable rings. Bonus stages just get you nice little extras like more rings or more points, or the ability to manually choose your character and level, which many would say would probably be a standard thing you could do in most other video games. That and it drains your ring count, so more often than not, it's just not worth your time. Again though, you do still have special stage rings, but they once again adopt Sonic 1's ability to jump into it, that being grab 50 rings, head to the end of the level, and jump into the ring at the goalpost. So yeah, these maps make zero sense. You clear any hazards out of the way so you can compensate for all the goofy nonsense that comes with these stupid tethered abilities, and you remove any reason to properly explore these levels, which is extra frustrating when you think back to that opening isolated island tutorial area. What happened to that? You had to anchor your partner on one button while you made your way to another one, or use them to levitate a platform and drag you up the side of it. I mean, there are a couple of kind of similar gimmicks throughout the levels, but I'm seriously racking my brain here. I don't think we see these particular puzzles ever again, which is kind of lame. They could have really expanded upon these ideas, really make you think these things through. But I don't really think there are any proper platforming puzzles that require teamwork. Also, before I forget, there are item monitors here, but if you were expecting more creative elemental shields, you'd be out of luck. The original shield is back, as is invincibility, which weird gripe, but the animation feels like a downgrade from Sonic 3. And of course you have your 10 ring box, but that's all that returns. You do get some new ones, like character boxes who turn you into, well, whoever's on the screen at the time. And that is a nice little way to add variety. And in hindsight, these could have been implemented a little better if these levels had 
specific challenges set aside for specific characters, a la Mario 64 DS. And you also have the swap monitor, which, well, just swaps the two characters on the screen for a little while. But you also have monitors that allow you to grow and shrink. But once again, they're not really utilized. This would have been interesting if there were some environmental obstacles for you to overcome, but that's not the case here. The big sprite turns you into a bruiser for a little while, and the small sprite just is kind of a pain in the ass. You're just gonna end up sitting around waiting for that to wear off. The growing and shrinking monitors really are only here to show off some graphical effects of the 32X. The blue ring box is about the only useful new monitor here, which clumps all of your collected rings into one larger ring, giving you the chance to hold on to everything you've grabbed up to that point if you happen to get hit. You couple that with the shield, it's like a secondary bonus hit. This game is... Uh, it's just a glorified tech demo for the 32X. We have a cool set of physics thanks to the tether, even if it doesn't work super well in a Sonic game, and we have some graphical gimmicks that had been done already by Nintendo with some Super FX chips, so this was already outdated by 1995, and these goofy little graphical upgrades would have been just fine for a standard Sonic game. And yeah, maybe that would have been a safe choice. Maybe it would have been a tired choice, but it would have at least been another solid win under Sega's belt. Instead, we got a game full of weird ideas that are not properly thought through, and sacrifice a lot of standardized design in an attempt to make this tether work. And when you have to compromise as much as this game does, well, most other developers that were at Sega's level would have known when to call it quits. But Sega's gonna be Sega. And if I'm honest with myself, that's what had me intrigued. We know about Sonic Crackers, the proof of concept of this game. Hell, we honestly have a great deal of information of the behind the scenes production of this title. And maybe it's because of this extra knowledge, it gives me the impression that they went above and beyond with their determination to make the ring tether work. Despite all the changes from Sonic Crackers to the final design, this stuck around and they built an entire game around it. Maybe not to the best it could have been and maybe just to show off the stupid tricks of the 32X, but there was something about this that they believed in. And I think, even as a kid, I could see hints of brilliance shine through. I know this is technically not a good game. I'm not about to tell you that this is a solid experience that everybody needs to play. But at the same time, I find it challenging to flat out call it bad as well. There's still something alluring about this title. Something that always keeps it in the back of my mind. Something that makes me look back on it quite fondly. And I know I'm not the only one. So, while I have spent a great deal of time detailing the negatives of this game, I'm now going to spend even more time telling you why I love all of it. I never started this channel with the intention of picking apart the classic trilogy. Truth be told, that's been done to death and arguably a lot better by other people. Best I could hope to do was potentially provide some kind of unique insight and unique jokes and just be as passionate as possible, but it's called Game Apologist for a reason, and Chaotix is a game I am much more interested in picking apart and trying to understand. What is it about this game that makes people, myself included, overlook some very obvious flaws and still have a good time? How do I describe such a specific and surreal experience? Well, a hefty chunk of that is probably because of nostalgia. And I mean proper nostalgia. Like, this came from a different time of my life, and I only really remember the good and fuzzies it made me feel. I never had a whole lot of experience with this game to grow sick and tired of it. So Chaotix, for a long time, felt like a dream. One of those dreams that makes sense while you're experiencing it, but once you wake up, immediately everything feels absurd. And while it was just so vivid moments ago, for some reason, I can't quite recall what I experienced. But even if the details are fuzzy, I still remember the emotions I experienced. And that's what this game was for me. A weird dream that I could not quite remember, but still enjoyed. Or maybe this is just what hallucinogens look like. So yes, absence does make the heart grow fonder. And I certainly had Sega Stockholm Syndrome. I wanted the 32X to play one single game, and I really only had that one game. I also think I had crappy Doom, but that game scared the hell out of me, and and I'm not proud of that. But my point is, and I'm sure many of you can relate as well, I was excited for this game for specific weird reasons, and I was determined to love it. So I gave it more time than I probably should. So yes, I'm gonna sound biased, and I'm gonna sound nostalgic, but I don't always think that's a bad thing. I think if you properly understand why something isn't the best it can be, and still love it anyway, that's a perspective worth looking into. And I won't always be able to be as personally invested with a game like I am with this one. But for now, I am. And hopefully, through this perspective, I can properly detail to you why I love this game so much.
here's the thing about all the complaints I spent an exhausting amount of time detailing to you. The biggest sin this game actually makes is just that it's kind of boring if you play it too long. Out of all of those problems, none of them were born from frustration. I was never worried about busted controls or cheap deaths. It's a finished game, it's not a glitchy mess, and it didn't instill blood boiling rage like some of the later 3D games would go on to do. But this game still has that strange experimental messy magic of some of the 3D titles. I knew the flaws even back then, but for some reason I still found myself thinking about this game after I put it down, wanting to give it another shot. And I know a massive part of that is personal preference. I have spoken with people who have found this game very frustrating, but it's definitely an easier laid back experience for a Sonic game and I don't always think that's a bad thing. And I noticed that about my personal gaming preferences. Sometimes it's okay to just dick around. And that's what I use this game for. Sometimes all I need is a couple of levels of swinging around a couple of colorful cartoon characters to some catchy tracks, and I'm good. And sometimes that's just how you play games as a little kid. People still remember Sonic 1 fairly fondly just because of Green Hill Zone. And I know the fan base nowadays is sick and tired of it, and yes, the rest of the game isn't quite as good as that first level, but back in the 90s, sometimes all you had was a demo booth and that one first level, and that was all you needed. You weren't super concerned with zipping across the level as quickly as possible, it was just fun to control Sonic and jump around all these hills and find some satisfaction in exploring all these nooks and crannies. And yeah, it's not exactly straightforward in terms of design, but it was still fun to explore, even if there wasn't much of a reward getting there. And I think as a kid, I treated the entire game of Knuckles Chaotix like that. It also makes me think of Mario Sunshine. Both games have a heavy focus on a brand new mechanic that's strapped onto something familiar, and both games keep a pretty consistent theme. Now that I think about it, both of them kind of have a tropical vacation vibe. And for some people, they're going to be annoyed with the lack of variety in the levels, or be frustrated at being forced to deal with a silly new gimmick when you wanted something more familiar. But for others, if you're enjoying the music, the characters, the visuals, it's not going to be much of a setback for you. And maybe you've had your fill of traditional Sonic, or in Sunshine's case, Mario. Yeah, you have fun with Sonic, but why not mix that chocolate with the peanut butter and see what you get? And no, you don't always get Reese's, but it's still fun to experiment. I mean, we still love those silly Sonic mods for a reason, right? As deceptively simple as Sonic can be, and how natural those games flow once you get the hang of them, you still have to take the time and learn how the game rolls. And while it can and should be a fun process, I am aware that that can be somewhat taxing to other players. And it's been a very long time since I was a kid, so I'm sure the classic Sonic games gave me way more trouble than I'm remembering. But with a little patience, with a little practice, the game feels so utterly rewarding just by simply moving around. And I think that's kind of the same thing for the ring tether. That's not to say you need to force yourself to get good at a bad mechanic, but I would argue that it's incredibly rewarding once you know what you're doing. And the more I played around with it, the more I saw why the developers were so determined to make it work. Pulling off a proper slingshot is satisfying. Chucking your partner up onto a platform above you, having them anchor you while you build up tension and shoot upwards, that's awesome. And that's not something you can do with a standard spin dash. And that is not to say that they could have built levels a little bit better to take advantage of situations like this, but if you tackle those levels with that mindset, I think you're going to have a pretty good time. Speaking of, I know I already pointed out that they had to compromise a lot in level design to make the ring mechanic work, and yes, it could have been better. I honestly don't mind having fewer badniks and zero pitfalls. And honestly, the lack of badniks isn't for the entire game. That's for a lot of levels, sure, but I did notice quite a few of them on the back half of the axe, so I don't know if it was just for specific levels or they were just adding more challenges as you got deeper into specific attractions. I think it's a little bit of both. Either way, the lack of a life system does cut down on the challenge. And I wonder if they try to compensate that with the lack of checkpoints. I don't know. This game's so easy, I didn't even notice the lack of them until I started thinking about it just now. The levels can be a little dull and confusing at points, but if you're wanting to just run around, the stages are far from offensive. And while I don't believe the giant special stage rings are implemented the best way possible. I feel like a lot of people agree that the special stages themselves are some of the best in terms of classic Sonic. 
Here, you must guide Lemmingwings through the maze of the small intestine and solve the riddle of the Katata fish. Like previous special stages, this was a chance for the developers to show off some technically impressive 3D gameplay. Man, they just get better and better every time. I can't wait for Sonic to go full 3D. Clearly, Sega knows what they're doing. And yeah, I know they look a bit dated now, but this looked really cool in the 90s. And I still think they're a lot of fun today. Seriously, if you had told me that they had started this project with the special stages in mind, and the rest of the game was just secondary, I probably believe you. Because it feels like a lot more thought was put into these layouts compared to the game proper. I rolled my eyes at Infinite Blue Spheres. I mean, yeah, they were fun, but it took me a long time to master them. I wasn't really feeling like jumping into another set of them after I collected the Super Emeralds. But with Chaotix, I would have taken a full game set up like this. You don't get a half pipe, you get a full pipe. At least at first. You do have some platforming challenges, narrow walkways, bumpers, pitfalls, hazards, and this was all pretty impressive stuff. Not new for 1995, but new for the Sonic series. I did have a ring out that felt cheap here and there, but I do feel like they did a fine job bumping up the difficulty from level to level as I followed my nose to each and every new Fruit Loop. But at times, they might be a little bit too forgiving. Honestly, outside of Genesis 3D Blast, this might be the easiest set of special stages. They do offer a bit of challenge, but they also allow you to swing back around through the track if you miss some blue spheres. Granted, you have to be sure you have enough rings to do that, as they will count down as a timer. So that is a good excuse to build up some rings before you jump into the special stage ring. Because outside of that 50 ring entry fee, whatever you bring in with you is your starting point for a counter. So yes, the special stages I think are a lot of fun, but they don't give you any real incentive to grab all of them. I mean, you do get a cameo from Sonic and Tails, which is great. Also, how is nobody talking about Naked Leg Sonic? This is the good ending? You couldn't even color him correctly? Dude couldn't even be bothered to put on pants for this event. I guess Knuckles wasn't the only one going commando. You do get the cooler ending if you don't get all of them, and um... Well, never mind the low stakes. Yikes. And they don't unlock any super forms, which, yeah, I get it, but it's still kind of a bummer. There's not much a traditional super form can really do in these stages. Again, this game's pretty easy. Still would have been nice if it allowed your character to freely move around without the partner, or I don't know. I'm sure that would have required a hell of a lot of programming for just a silly bonus. These levels are designed with a climbing partner in mind, after all. And speaking of those partners, they are both a weak and strong point for this game, depending on how you look at it. Like I've said before, if they were so hell-bent on getting this ring tether to work, I kind of feel like they should have provided us with characters that didn't have as many abilities as the Sonic cast seems to have, forcing them to rely on the sling ring and also maybe get a chance to design better levels around that, as opposed to just taking a Sonic level and clearing the path for you to putz around with a couple of shackled speed demons. But that was just one idea in an attempt to elevate the tether and, well, heavy and bomb. But that's not to say you can't have some fun with the rest of the cast. There are enough vertical spaces to shoot Espio up the side of a wall, and I never got tired of seeing him run around on the ceiling, as needless as it ended up being. And Mighty, just being a Sonic clone, feels nice and zippy. The wall jump might not be the neatest trick in the world, but it pairs well with Mighty's speed, allowing you to practically ricochet off a wall and keep your momentum going. And I can tell you how versatile Vector ended up being, thanks to his wall climb and directional jump. I didn't realize it at the time, but Triple Jazz's Sonic Freedom Alpha features a similar mechanic mechanic, and while I do love it there, I also appreciate how zippy vectors can be. So yeah, I meant no disrespect, Triple Jazz, I hope we can still be friends. Oh no, dude, it's it's totally okay, I just make games, you have all the hard work complaining about them. And Charmy, good god, this little dude just free flies all over the place. Without the ring tether, it practically breaks the game, but that doesn't make it any less fun. It kind of makes me wish they could have implemented something like this for Super Sonic, that would have been super rad. Now all these characters feel fine enough even with a tether on them, but that is still the greatest drawback, because all these characters would probably feel a lot better on their own. And despite all of my playthroughs, there's nothing here that shows these abilities working in tandem with each other. And even if you do figure something out, it doesn't feel intentional on the game's part, more just skilled players figuring out some neat ways to combine everything. Then again, that forced cooperation wasn't exactly my favorite thing in Sonic Advance 3 or Sonic 4 Episode 2, but even in those cases, I personally feel like the failures fall on the developers. 
not the idea itself. And even saying that, trying to imagine developing scenarios that accounted for all the potential team-ups and abilities, I'm starting to understand why this game did not come together. Because all these great ideas branch out into a plethora of other great ideas. And while there is some extra attention to the sling ring, they still didn't really focus on one core set of mechanics here. And it ends up being a jack-of-all-trades, master of none. All of these characters still feel great, and honestly, I'm glad they exist and still exist. But the more I think about it, the more I'd like to see them strike out in solo gameplay. Hell, I'd even take more focus on the sling ring and see its full potential. There had to be more to this gimmick. They clearly had a lot of great and dynamic ideas for the Sonic formula, so why were they so hell-bent on this stupid tether? Well, the answer is obvious, but it's not one I see a lot of people talk about. Something I found surprising when researching Sonic 2 was that apparently, the game was designed with two players in mind. After all of these years, I tend to forget how much emphasis they put on Tails' inclusion in that game. Because when I play it now, I don't think of multiplayer. I was thinking about the streamlined single-player Sonic experience. There's nothing in these levels that screams two-player to me. You don't even need Tails on screen. No, the special stages are objectively easier without him. I'm sorry, Gilly, I know I just cameoed on your Sonic 2 video, but Tails makes the special stages objectively harder simply by upping the ring count. I don't care if he only loses the rings he collects. What difference does that make if it's still up to me to pick up his slack? I'm still the one that has to collect all those extra rings, and the bomb smacks are still super distracting anyway. Ah, well, it's honestly not that big of a deal, and the game does give you the option to play Sonic or Tails solo, so it's really a non-issue. So I hope we can still be friends, Gilly. Get out. Get out of here. Go home. You're dead to me. Uh, get out. Get out! Right now, it's the end of you and me. Ultimately, whoever was Sonic was getting the meat of the experience. Chaotix, after all that time, was still trying to solve the multiplayer problem, and building it around a system that forced two players to work together was certainly an inspired thought. So just to test how well this works when you bond two characters with rings together, I decided to bring in someone who was bonded to me by a ring. Uh, it's me. I'm not Nick. Uh, so yeah, I sat down and played with Nick. Yes. And I'm not a Sonic player, so it was a very interesting experience for me. Uh, no, but at first I found it really counterproductive. Being lassoed to another character just felt like you were yanking each other around in every direction except the one you wanted to go in. Especially when you had Heavy, or one of us had Heavy. I, yeah, I had Heavy yeah. completely accidentally, and he can't jump more than two inches off the ground, and there's nothing I could do, so you just had to pick me up and like carry me yep. through segments, which was awesome. <laughs> um, I had the most time playing Charmy, and that was fun just because I was dicking around and not going anywhere except to the ceiling. <laughs> that is a good point, though. Like, I didn't think about that through this entire rambling nonsense I've been doing. There are kind of different levels of experience that these different characters provide. Absolutely. I mean, that's pretty standard for any, well, any well made game where you've got, <laughs> you know, multiple characters selections. They yeah. shouldn't be identical choices that are just aesthetically different. It should always be, you know, skill set and specialty based. And that's still the case here. You know, right. Charmy's got his flight and I can just bumble along wherever I feel like it. I love a bumble. Um, <laughs> and SVO, I played with SVO, which was good because he can do the wall climbing, which isn't as fun as flying, but it's a close second. It's fun, right? It's useless, but it's super fun. Or once I got the hang of it, it was fun. I had a lot of fun when like, you're like just running across the ceiling and I'm just bouncing along the bottom. <laughs> yeah, yo-yo effect for sure. <laughs> but I didn't understand what you were talking about with this being, you know, a two-player thing in relation to the other Sonic games, because I've always seen you play them, but obviously it's always been solo. Right. And um, Sonic 2, as soon as you turned that on, I realized, like, what the problem was. Yeah. Because I've always seen you just zip through all of these levels as fast as humanly possible. Like, so mm -hmm. fast that because I'm not a Sonic player, I'm like, where, the, where are we? <laughs> 
Yeah. <laughs> but as player two, like that's still the case. And in half a second, I'm off screen if I don't know which direction we're going in or what's happening. Or if I go too far, if, like if I go forward ahead of you, mm-hmm. again, I can't see the next thing to fall off of. So now I've fallen off a cliff and I can't see because there's no split screen. Right. You know, so I feel like that was an effort that they made to put a second <laughs> sure player was. in there. It was uh, not a good effort. <laughs> <laughs> Even if I knew what I was doing, I don't think it would have been very feasible for me to keep up with you. For that reason alone, as soon as we we started playing, I realized what the point of Knuckles Chaos was. Yeah. You know, um, for better or for worse, you're completely tethered to the person that you're playing with, um, and you can't just, like, ditch them <laughs> yeah. at all. No. <laughs> <laughs> on another hand, I didn't see a lot of point to it other than keeping you two on the same screen and yeah. s- connected. Like, there didn't feel like there was a whole lot of teamwork really necessary. It was, hey, can you both not stop each other from getting to the finish line? <laughs> yeah, no, we spent more time just trying to figure out how to survive a level than we did anything else. There wasn't any puzzles laid out for us to sort out. Well, and it wasn't even survival level. That would have been something, you know, you have to teamwork your way through some enemies, but there really weren't a lot of enemies in the no. levels that we played in Chaotix. Um, even when I was playing Charmy, and we went through all of mm-hmm. the levels. So, no, like, they're just, it was, can you make it to the finish line? And that was kind of it. Yeah, no, I think our greatest challenge while we were playing at those couple of sessions was when I was heavy. Was just trying to get up the side <laughs> of a freaking ramp, like this basic Sonic thing. Oh, yeah. And our greatest challenge was, like, how do we get up the side of this damn thing? I ended up picking up a robot and just holding Hoping for the best. <laughs> well, we kind of did that with SBO2, though. Oh, yeah. No, we um, did that with everybody. You know, because you would just a- automatically spin dash to the little loop-de-loop, and mm-hmm. I'd be over here like, wait, what? And of course, because we're connected, it's just yo-yo effect. Suddenly, you're back yeah. with me on the floor. All right, I'm leaving now. All right. Thank you, Wifey Warrior. <laughs> two, two. Bye. No? Okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that was fun. And as she pointed out, there were a lot of problems even when you had multiplayer involved. But from my perspective, I have to admit, I did have a lot of fun. The experience is so much more enjoyable when you have a real life partner joining in. And sure, you could say that with just about anything, but if a game's designed around a multiplayer experience, I think it's important to experience the multiplayer. Nobody is Tails in this setup. And yes, again, it still can be messy if you're both trying to go in different directions. It's kind of like that scene from Wild Wild West. Anyone remember that move? Okay. But when you work in tandem, it brings a whole new life to the game. Like to the point where I really need to stress that this is how you should play Chaotix. It's the difference between an arena shooter with real people versus one filled with bots. You still get the core idea and can have a lot of fun on your own, but the human element makes all the difference. And I know this is not a one-for-one comparison, but it's only here did I really feel like I truly understood what they were going for with this game. Yeah, a lot of it's still silly gimmicks, but this feels like the ultimate goal they were going for. But you still can't discount all the nonsense that is still involved, even with multiplayer. You have to wade through a lot of crap just to get to this point. Even getting the second player set up is an absolute chore. You need to beat the tutorial level first and by yourself. I have no idea why they didn't want a second player involved with this. I feel like this would be imperative. Hell, second player mode should have had its own unique tutorial. But yeah, you don't get that here. You have to play that single player mode and isolated island. After that, you have to exit the game properly. I don't really remember. I had to read through isolated island like three times before I figured out how to get that stupid option onto the screen. Which doesn't make any sense to me because I know on some beta builds, they had a second player option right there on the title screen. I have no idea why they removed it. They still give you the option for tutorial, even though you're forced to go through it anyway. I don't know. And ultimately, as much as me and my wife talked about it already, she did also mention how much better it felt when you were playing one of these characters by themselves. They were rare moments, but it was truly liberating. The ring mechanic works well and can lead to some great fun, but no matter how much more development they slapped into this, I don't really think there's any change in the fact that a pure single-player Sonic gameplay experience is just better. That doesn't mean they didn't have a fun idea in their hands here. But I'm not about to tell you that Chaotix is secretly a must-play masterpiece when you bring in somebody else for the ride. No matter how you play it, the game still needed work. But if you are going to play it, I highly recommend you get a second controller and see what kind of fun you can get when you bring in somebody else. My wife doesn't play Sonic games, but out of all the other classic games, despite the flaws, I think Chaotix might have done it the best.
I think I've said just about everything I can say about Chaotix. I've rambled on for quite a long time, but even when it's all said and done, I still don't feel like I've properly conveyed how I feel about this game. Let me try and put it to you this way. If Christian Whitehead showed up at my door and told me I had to choose between Sonic 3 and Knuckles or Knuckles Chaotix to get a mobile port, I would probably choose Knuckles Chaotix. Even knowing it's the lesser of the two games, even knowing Sonic 3K is my favorite game of all time, even knowing S3K deserves it way more than Chaotix, even knowing it's the bad choice, that's the selfish choice I would make. Because as much as I love 3K, I've had plenty of opportunities to play the game. And again, I know that's not the same for everybody else. Not everybody had a DS or an Xbox, GameCube, <laughs> Genesis, Saturn. And I get that. Again, this is a a selfish choice, but Chaotix didn't get those chances. It showed up on the 32X, which out of personal experience, even back then I can tell you was a piece of finicky trash, and on a defunct gaming service called GameTap. And yes, I did sign up for GameTap just to play Chaotix back in the day, and that was the only game I played on that service, and I have no regrets. But GameTap doesn't exist anymore, and you really should not be buying a 32X just to play Chaotix. It's a weird little game that I could really only recommend to hardcore Sonic fans that are interested in the history of the franchise. Like I said, no matter how much development they put into something like this, if they made a solo release of this game on mobile and charge money for it, reviewers are going to tear this thing apart and honestly, rightfully so. Even with widescreen support, even with online multiplayer, even with a smoother set of special stages, even with these lovely flourishes that made this the best version of Chaotix, it still has all those other flaws we talked about. A game like this could really only exist in a collection like Sonic Gems, when that's packed in with other weird obscure Sonic titles so you can experience this history and also feel like you got your money's worth. And yes, as much as I love the Gems collection, the lack of Chaotix is absolutely a mark against that disc. Because personally, I feel like they missed the boat when it comes to re-releasing Chaotix. Bringing it out again in a solo experience is a stupid idea. Regardless, as I just said, I would happily support it. And if I was given control of that kind of insane decision, I would make the bad decision. Because here's the thing about Knuckles Chaotix. If you have only experienced this game through the opinions of YouTubers, you can't really enjoy all of that music while we are rambling away like lunatics. These characters, these animations, this aesthetic, this music, it all comes together into an experience not quite like anything else you'll ever see. Yeah, it's a little messy here and there, but that doesn't mean you can't have fun. And I can't properly describe to you how inviting everything felt when Dorn to Summer started playing for the first time, or how blown away I was when I saw that big red metal Sonic. It might just remain a weird dream of my childhood, and I'd be okay with that, because I really don't need a whole lot of reviewers picking apart this game saying, I don't see what the big deal is, I don't know why anybody likes it. Like, ugh, just, you don't get it, man. And it's not like a knock against Cybershell's video either. He is super familiar with Knuckles chaotic like to a level like I can't even compare it to I learned a lot just from watching his video so even when he's tearing into that game and the lost potential of a knuckle spin-off series I understand it's coming from a Sonic fan who knows what he's talking about so even if we don't have the same experience with the game I had a great time listening to him so yeah obviously meant no disrespect cyber shell I hope we could still be friends I don't even know who you are this game is so unique that I honestly feel like you should really play it for yourself really sit down with some people patience and some time to figure out the sling ring and what your favorite character is to play around with. Because if you've been looking at all this footage, hearing this music, and not really bothered by the idea that this game's a little easier than the other ones, you might find yourself falling in love with this game like I and probably a handful of other people have as well. Because there is still a lot here worth loving. I mean, for crying out loud, I didn't bother getting into a whole lot with the characters in this video because, well, I've spent two months leading up to this point going into all of them. Look how much we had to talk about just from this one goofy game. 
there's a lot to appreciate and explore here. And even if they didn't bring this game back and remastered it or whatever else, you can still tell that there are great ideas that maybe they weren't fleshed out to the best of their ability in Chaotix, and maybe some of them should have been abandoned, but there are other ones that just needed a little push over that finish line. And you see hints of that in little bits and pieces in future Sonic media. I've seen constant comments pointing out how the Chaos Rings look like the World Rings from Sonic and the <laughs> Secret Rings. But let's also not forget Sonic Colors, which also takes place in a theme park. And you know, those laser diamonds look awfully familiar. And of course, we can't forget Sonic Mania. We got the triumphant return of Mighty. They've implemented that blue ring box. There's a lovely reference to the giant red Metal Sonic with Metal Sonic's other transformation. And I seriously doubt Studiopolis would exist without some references from this game. I'm seeing a lot of amazing arena in this design. And maybe the Chaotix cast isn't as full as it could be in modern Sonic terms, but the Detective Agency is still a great set of characters. And comic artists and writers have shown us how much potential we can get just from a silly glitch like the Wecknia. I've seen commenters saying that they saw that as like a ghost of a guardian past who's haunting Knuckles. Like that's a really cool idea. When I was a kid, I think what disappointed me the most about Chaotix was that I had all these extra characters and I expected this to balloon out into a grand Sonic adventure like S3K was. And yeah, in hindsight, knowing why they pushed it out as quickly as they did, I understand that was not a feasible option, but I don't see why that isn't the case nowadays. I mean, whatever with Mania 2, what if we got Chaotix 2? You pick one of these five characters and explore levels actually based around their abilities. Or you know what? Even have that sling ring possible. Maybe you have elements where you have to disconnect for a little bit while you guys solve separate puzzles. I don't know. The possibilities are endless. Whether it be piecemeal to really make these ideas shine, or even bringing back that flawed original game, I would welcome it with open arms. No, it's not my favorite game in the franchise, and on its own, I can't really tell people that they should go out and play it. But if you are the type of person that can sit through a video like this, engage the entire time, and you have never played the game, well then what are you waiting for? has been November Chaotix. This has been Chaotix Plus. This has been Chaotixmas. This has been the Game Apologist. And despite all the bad, I hope you saw some good in Knuckles Chaotix. Toot toot, Team Chaotix. Chaotix.